Hey folks, welcome back to the fifth and final episode of the Blue Catfish Truth Series. With our final episode here, we're going to cover a fair amount of ground. We're going to cover fish consumption advisories, what kind of fish we should harvest. Though we touched that before, we're going to get into a few more points on it here. Salinity tolerance, movement, range expansion, and finally the questions that you all had, you know, as subscribers, viewers, and fishermen who are concerned about blue catfish, either from the fisheries management side or just loving to catch them. Oh, and of course, <laughs> where to find them and how to catch them. We're gonna get into that too. So let's get to the video. I got a lot of questions from everybody on YouTube, or, you know, Instagram, Facebook. We're gonna get into all those questions, but I can knock a lot of those questions out by basically going through a species profile. Okay. Of this of blue catfish. Actually, we probably I know some inquiring minds out there want to touch on flathead as well, so maybe we can touch those waters as well. Okay. So let's start right here and let's go with what is the size range for blue catfish? And I, I guess when I say size range, we know that you can have, of course, very small blue catfish. We saw a bunch of them today because oh, yeah. you know, recently hatched very young specimens. Mm -hmm. What's the upper end? The upper end, um, well. The, the world record blue catfish was caught on Bugs Island Reservoir in Virginia. Now that's a reservoir, mm -hmm. okay? James River, uh, tidal rivers in general, there was fish that have been caught up to 102 and change. <laughs> so these are very large fish. That's huge. Imagine reeling in oh. a, a hundred pound anything. And then trying to hold it for the picture. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And so, I mean, that had to be amazing. But um, really, the heyday of blue cat fishing uh, was in the James River. Uh, and it was around 2007, 2008. Uh, this is documented based on our electric fishing surveys. Mm -hmm. But I've also talked to many catfish anglers and guides that have said the exact same thing. And it's really cool when angler information coincides with uh, fisheries research. Oh yeah. And so it's been real interesting to go into these blue cat or these catfish meetings, these public meetings. And you know, we're pretty much on the same page as far as what's happening with populations. Um, a lot of those older individuals are starting to age out. Um, the Rappahannock, for example, we're talking about a river that's majority of the fish are around 12 inches. Yeah, it, it, you'll, you'll see it in the video as yeah. well from, the, from our electro fishing today. Yeah. The majority of the fish that we saw were, goodness, maybe, really maybe, small. maybe about like six inches up to about maybe 16 would define the average. Yeah, with maybe a few, a handful of fish that had any weight to them. Oh yeah, we yeah. Caught I got, a I got a picture of some nice ones, yeah. A 38 pounder, yep. which you know, we're talking about tidal blue catfish heyday. That was relatively small mm -hmm. in terms of trophy angling. Um, so things have changed. We're not sure it's likely ever going to be that good again. Like I said, there's what happened in the blue catfish uh, fishery in Virginia is there was this really long protracted population increase into the 90s. It probably peaked in the Rappahannock in the 90s. Pamunkey, Mattapanai, about the same. James River, it peaked in the mid-2000s. And, and now we are where we are, where um, we have an overabundance of, of smaller individuals. Coupled with that is that growth rates have, have really dropped. So on the James River, um, to reach 30 pounds, it used to take about 10 years, mm -hmm. now it's taking 15 years. Oh wow. So it's a five year lag in growth. So and that could partially be due to overabundance. Yep, exactly. Which is why we're talking about this compromise between these stakeholders is harvest, harvest, harvest up to a certain threshold, whatever that threshold may be, 22 inches, 32 inches, somewhere in there, mm -hmm. and then leave the rest of them undisturbed for anglers. Exactly. That's the compromise that we're talking about that is likely going to really uh, beneficially impact the, the 
ecosystem and also the angling and the commercial fishing community. Everybody involved. Yeah. That's the hope. Yeah, that's the hope. Right. <laughs> yeah. In terms of fishing for blue cats, describe to us what would you consider the optimal areas, structure, bait. Oh, that's perfect. Um, so, where we see the most large individuals and the most biomass in general are going to be these big sweeping bends in the river, the outer edge, where it's these big depth contours, where it drops off 20, 30, 40, down to 90, 100 feet in some places on the James River. And you're going to see those big fish there. Yep. All right. So, you know, kind of describe some of the best habitat, right? Yep. Um, and if you're real lucky and you find a real nice sunken tree or old barge or some dock pylons or some type of physical structure down there, you couple that with the deep contours and the bends in the river and deep holes, yeah. that's your money fishing spot. Oh, yeah. And there are hundreds of these types of areas up and down the tidal rivers in Virginia. So they're not all that hard to find. It's just a matter of making the effort to get out there and fish it. So um, a lot of the more successful anglers will use cut gizzard shaft. Some folks will go... Uh, and, and the fresher the bait, the better. Yep, that's what I've heard. Yep, the fresher the bait, the better. A lot of people will go out and try to um, catch gizzard shad before they start catfish. Yeah. Um, if you want to catch some of the smaller fish, you know, you can use some of those typical catfish uh, baits, shrimp, squid, uh, chicken livers, chicken gizzards. You know, there's a lot of different... Uh, catfish baits out there and that's one of the great things about catfish that's right yeah. and it's a, it's a really good fish to first get your kids hooked on fishing oh yeah because they're fairly easy to catch and um and they're high abundant and they're fun that's it Woo! all we gotta do is pull the rod tip up that's it oh he's so strong all right victoria here he comes here he comes Woo! here he comes Woo! get him yeah. oh and the hook came out right there oh yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you bring that fishing to the table you know with my daughters i get them to catch the fish believe it or not i can actually i can get them to clean the fish <laughs> and then they hand bread it cook the fish yeah. and eat it, it it's it, my, my daughters are the same way the water to the table and it instills this really cool um perception of the outdoors exactly yep it's not just about the fish it's not just about being on the river it's about experiencing nature being outside and knowing that if they want to they could go catch a fish and eat for a day exactly provide for right? yourself and your family yep yep love it so we told you where to target them you're looking for those deep river bends especially in proximity to structure yep. whether it's a tree or a dock or a boathouse whatever it may be yeah we talked about what to use now. So best bait for the big ones, if you can get it, fresh gizzard shad. But when it comes to catfish, especially if you're not necessarily keen on those real big tanks out there, if you just want to catch some nice sized catfish, the chicken livers, any other types of, you know, cut bait, worms, shrimp, squid. It's a, it's a, that's a good time. It's a good time. It's a real and, good time. And it's, you know, these catfish are in a lot of different habitats. Yep. Those big bends are just the best. Exactly. Um, also, these creek mouth openings, these creek mouths, yeah, can yeah, also be good. good. Yep. Good point. That's also something I want to bring up. Another thing I wanted to get into is blue catfish movement, dispersal, range expansion. Okay. So, I'm going to leave it a little open-ended there. Oh, sure. But that's something we're definitely concerned about because as a fisherman, as a crab or whoever you might be, that's what you're looking at is where are these fish going? Where have they been spotted? Where are they expanding their range? So I'll stop yeah. right there and hand it back to you. So, you know, some of the first folks that key in on new uh, areas of, of uh, colonization are anglers. Oh yeah. 
right? Yep. Anglers and commercial fishers. And so um, a lot of those folks may key in on, on a range expansion first. But um, we have a comprehensive data set Department of Game and Inland Fisheries data going back into the 90s, as well as uh, a data set from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science with their Chesapeake Bay Trawl Survey, mm -hmm. and they pick up blue catfish as well. Yep. So between those two surveys, we can we can tell. Okay, we can put a GPS point down. We caught blue catfish here, 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 and here. And then we can do that over time, and it'll create dots all over a map. Yep. And in one of the Virginia Tech papers, um, we show that information, and it shows the uh, basically the presence absence of uh, of blue cat. And again, I'll have links to these in the description, and if you want yeah. to reference the studies and graphics yourself. Yeah. So they're widely distributed. The interesting thing about blue catfish is uh, the reason why they can disperse so widely is because they can move and they can move long distances um they're they are one of if not the most highly migratory freshwater catfish in north america yeah. <laughs> so um this fish is native to the mississippi and the missouri and it can go long distances in those systems well they can do the same thing here so Case in point, in 2015, 2016, um, myself and some other researchers placed acoustic tags surgically into the abdominal cavities of 30 blue catfish on the Rappahannock and on the Pamunkey River, and we monitored those fish movements up and down the rivers with acoustic telemetry. What I mean by that is we had different receivers. It's basically like sonar. Yep. Where the receiver is in the water, and if a fish with a tag swims by, it'll emit a, a frequency, a pulse like sonar. It receives that, and it's like an individual social security number that we have. And so we're able to tell where that fish moved and at what date and time. Some fish, and this is kind of general to a lot of different fish species, some fish high dispersal, and, and this is key to invasion dynamics, yep. because you'll have some very mobile individuals, and you'll have some that stay put, and that's exactly what we found. Um, what I was not expecting is that there are some fish that were within the 12 to 16 inch range that swam from Fredericksburg, well basically a few miles below Fredericksburg down to Tappahannock and then back. Holy shit. So we're talking about a really broad <laughs> range of these fish to be able to swim. And so you think about it too as far as salinity conditions. That was my next question. And yeah. freshwater flows. The further the freshwater goes down these tidal rivers, the more habitat it opens up to blue catfish. Blue catfish tend to have about a, like other, like other fish, have about a 15 parts per thousand point at which mortality starts to occur. Mm -hmm. They like, that's suboptimal for them. They like to be in lower salinity waters, but there's something in fisheries management called density dependence. What that means is there are so many fish in one spot that the other fish can't really survive unless they move to different places. Yes, I hear you. Right? Yep. So there's not enough resources or habitat available in the upper river reaches, so they start moving downstream. And that's generally what we see, especially during these high rainfall events. Last year, you know, we heard reports of blue catfish being caught way, way downstream into the Chesapeake Bay. They do move. They move with the fresh water. That's why they're widely distributed as well. All right, folks. So now, if you follow me on YouTube, if you follow me on Facebook, uh, I plan on continuing these kind of interviews as long as the fisheries biologists like Aaron here will have me. Communicating science is something I'm passionate about. Again, connecting 
the fisheries biologist and the fishery science to the fishermen, I am all about that mission in life. So to that end, I put out a request for questions not too long ago, and we're going to go through a few of those viewer requests, a few of those viewer questions sure. before, before we wrap everything up here. Let's do it. All right. So the first question I have right here is from Matthew White. So <laughs> what's up, Matt? And Matt's question is, do we have any information on the impact from blue cats or flatheads on the striped bass fishery? What we do have, we have that trophic dynamic study that I mentioned earlier. Yep. Um, Which again, I'll link to in the description. Yeah, and striped bass were found very rarely in the diets of blue catfish. Good to hear. That's really good to hear, especially because a lot of these fish will overlap with some of the um, some of the sandy shoreline habitats. So yep. A lot of these juvenile striped bass. I actually worked on um, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science striped bass same survey uh, way back in the 2000s. I'm a little bit jealous. And so, <laughs> and so, you know, got a little bit of background in striped bass. In my view, and a lot of angler views out there, the pinnacle of the, the, the fish world, yep. is the, the angling world to me, I just love striped bass. Oh, yeah. That's a personal preference for me. Yeah. But, um, so I don't want to see that fishery go down either. But at least as far as on, on the, the feeding aspect of it, a blue catfish, we didn't see a whole lot of predation, which is a good thing. When you talk about competitive interactions, that, that could use some further study. Okay. So to summarize then, we have not seen striped bass occur hardly at all in the diet of blue catfish. Is that accurate? I'd say so. Okay. But more study is needed in terms of seeing what that competitive interaction may result in. All right. I'd say this first statement. Fair enough. Hopefully, Matt, that answers your question. So the next question I have here is from Robert Kramer. And his question is, are blue catfish an overall threat to the balanced ecosystem, and are they an apex predator? Uh, we touched on that a little bit already. Yeah. I think my response, but I'm going to hand it over to you in a second, okay. would be that it's going to come down to what species we're talking about. Like, as we, we have confirmed impact, for instance, on white catfish. You know, we've seen displacement. Are they a threat to a balanced ecosystem? Uh, I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to hand that one back to you. Sure. And get it straight from a fisheries biologist. So, balanced ecosystem. Yeah, think about it. There's a lot of caveats to that question because yep. are we talking about the native pre-European That's a whole ecosystem? Can, can of worms right there. Are we talking about a hundred years ago yep. ecosystem where there's all these naturalized but yet non-native fish in the system? Yep. Um, and blue catfish have been here for 50 years, going on 50 years. Yep. So that's a hard nut to crack. Um, what we do know is that they are highly abundant. We've covered a lot of the, the impacts based on some of the, the studies that we can back up with data. And so I kind of kind of leave it to the data, really. Absolutely. Now, folks, Robert also asked if blue catfish are considered an apex predator. Aaron and I both missed that portion of the question in answering it immediately here. So Aaron reached out to give me an answer on that particular question. And what Aaron told me was that the research done from Virginia Tech on trophic dynamics shows that blue catfish aren't apex predators, but rather opportunistic omnivores. And we touched on this previously in the series. They eat plants, they'll eat mussels, they'll eat, you know, freshwater clams, but they will also eat fish. So it really comes down to what's available in the system at the time in terms of what they're going to eat. They eat a wide array of different food items. But as always, go to the, check out the links in the description because it has links to all the studies for you to check it out yourself. Question I got from Brock2755. <laughs> so that's the, that's the YouTube profile name. What are the recommended sizes to eat for blue catfish? And if there's a difference with flatheads, that'd be a great question to answer as well. Yeah, so, uh, again, uh, I'm going to punt, and I'm going to send you to the website, the Virginia Department of Health. Yep. And they have it listed by species, by river, and section of river. 
I think a lot of times they break it down in like pregnant women versus children yeah, versus that's true. adult it, men. I think a lot of the, the information that you see on that website is going to be a recommendation of two meals per month. Okay. Um, and then, like, there's a in the, the James River, uh, there's a do not eat. Uh, advisory on blue catfish over 32 inches. And I think that also falls into play with flatheads as well. So, but I really I point you to that website. There you go. I, that's that's the resource you should you should go go up there. You know, I like a three to eight pound fish. Yep. It provides a good fillet. Probably hasn't been in the river, but maybe four or five years. And so um, that's what I would personally key in on. I don't generally eat the larger fish, and if I do, I cut around the belly meat. I don't touch any of the belly, because that's where most of those contaminants will lie. What we end up putting into the environment is going to eventually make it back to our dinner plate. So it's, it's something to keep an eye on. Yeah. So folks, I think that about wraps it up here. There was a few more questions that people asked, but we're trying to keep this without speculation. Just keep this to the published science that Aaron has taken part in and been involved with. My goal with this series is to communicate to you the published peer-reviewed science. That's my goal out here, to get you the best information possible. So I don't want to ask questions, and Aaron doesn't, you know, rightfully so, yeah. doesn't want to weigh in on questions if we're not sure we're giving you the best information. That's exactly right. So, we've hit on this point before, but I think it's a great way to wrap up the series here. Aaron, you talked about compromise. Compromise. Right? Blue catfish are here. Blue catfish are here to stay. We're not going to get rid of them. That's right. It's a, we could try and try and try. They are an extremely resilient, adaptable species. So, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah. We have all these constituencies, all these stakeholders. In your mind, what's the best case compromise that we have for managing the fishery? Harvest. There you go. Harvest <laughs> up to a certain point. Yep. You leave some fish for the trophy anglers mm -hmm. and you harvest to significant levels from the lower to mid size ranges and everybody wins. That's the best we can do. Yep. Aaron, thank you very much for your time, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for taking me out on the boat. I'm pretty sure you're all going to enjoy the footage from out there. And questions or comments, let me know. We can always try to do follow-up series, reach out to Aaron with any more questions we come up with. But for right now, I think that wraps it up. All right. Thanks for having me. Hey, and t go take your kid fishing. Yes. Go buy your license and fish in Virginia. We have so many wonderful resources from the mountains to the coast. Yeah, so right. go fish. <laughs> go fish Virginia. I like it. Well, folks, I want to thank you for coming along on this ride with me. Hopefully you found this series useful. And I especially want to thank Mr. Aaron Bunch of the Virginia Department of Game and Land Fisheries. I couldn't have done this without them. You know, I, I can read the studies, but when it just it's so invaluable to have the actual input and insight of our fisheries biologists and professionals who are in the field studying and managing these species for us. So with all that being said, thanks very much. Let me know if you have any other questions or comments. I have a few more species in mind for what I might do next with this series, but if you have ones you'd like to see get done, let me know. Well, all right, folks, thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe, and y'all have a good one.